Hello band friends. This is a video to walk you through what we did in class today. So first thing before you start, you will need to download both of the handouts that are attached here. Annotation notes, ISNHO, and motives for European exploration, HRDG. So first I'm going to start on the annotation, annotating a source document. And there are some brief notes here that we do need to go over. So Let's talk about different types of sources. In order to understand people and events from the past, historians make inferences using documents. Inferences, if you're not sure what that means, that means we try and figure out what it is based on what we know, an inference, information you can draw out. So the first one, a blank is any kind of written or visual source of information, letters, artwork, films, maps, books, speeches, journal entries. So the correct for answer to this one is a source. Sorry, a source is any kind of written or visual source of information. Makes sense. A primary source is a document that was created by someone who was actually alive during the time period. So you can think about that as primary. That means they were the first people on the scene. They witnessed it with their own eyes. Some examples would be um, like a bystander at Obama's speech. So if he wrote a memoir, if he wrote a memoir, then what he said would be a primary source. Another example from history would be, um, let's say, a sermon given by a revolutionary pastor. So anything that he says, say maybe he's commenting on a historical uh, event, that would be considered a primary source because he was living in that time period and he was part of that era. Okay. So going on then, a secondary source, so we had primary, now we have secondary, is a document that's created by someone who did not live during the time period. So an example would be if Ms. Ward Bailey wrote a summary of Obama's speech. So I was not actually there. I'm just writing a summary. Maybe I read his memoir or I read the actual speech. I wasn't there. I'm writing a summary. So I am a secondary source. Another example would be um, a historian explaining the sermon given by a revolutionary pastor. So that's someone else, a secondary party, who's looking at usually primary sources and putting those together. Okay. So next we have a brief chart here at the bottom on how I would like you to annotate a document. Now I saw all of your annotations earlier this week. I thought they were all, all pretty good, very thorough. So I'm just going to go through this briefly on how I want you to annotate and then I'll show you a little example. So there's four basic things you should be doing when you're annotating a source. Commenting, finding the main ideas, circling vocabulary terms that you don't know, and then asking questions. So like we said before with the IC, it means you need to be responding to the text, engaging with it. So comments or connections, it's just like it sounds, connecting a fact or idea, commenting on how it makes you feel. And what you're going to do is you're going to underline the word or the phrase or sentence that struck you and then write your comment or connection in the margin. And I saw a lot of you doing this earlier this week. Main idea is just as it sounds. You're picking out the main idea, the most important parts, and then you're just going to underline or highlight it. Optional, I have seen people use symbols before, so a star means a main idea. Vocabulary terms, what I'd like you to do is not only circling the words that you don't know, but now making that extra step to actually define it. So trying to use context clues, prior experience, what you can know about different word parts or what it sounds like to figure out what it's talking about, or you can actually look it up. And finally, asking questions exactly like it sounds. Write a question because you're confused or because it makes you wonder something else, makes you to go deeper into it. So you're going to underline the word or phrase that struck you that prompted that question and then write your question in the margin. If you do come across the answer later in the text, you can always go back and add an answer to it, almost like you're having a conversation with yourself in the margins around the text. So now let's go over to our article for today. So motives for European exploration. We're looking at this for two reasons. One, because we want to understand what are the motives for European exploration and colonization, because this sets up the United States history. And also because I want to show you what I'm looking for when I want to annotate. So please understand I'm doing this on the computer, so it may not look exactly like if I were drawing it in class. Just bear with me. So I'm going to use a little highlighter tool. And first as I'm going through, what I'm going to be looking for is primarily the main idea. 
That's just because I can see there's one paragraph here that I'm going to start on looking for what is the main idea in that. Okay, so I see many factors encourage exploration. Looks like a title. Europeans had not been completely isolated from the rest of the world before the 1400s. Beginning around 1100, European crusaders battled Muslims for control of the Holy Lands in Southwest Asia. In 1275, the Italian trader Marco Polo reached the court of Kublai Khan in China. For the most part, however, Europeans had neither the interest nor the ability to explore foreign lands. That changed by the early 1400s. The desire to grow rich and to spread Christianity, coupled with advances in sailing technology, spurred an age of European exploration. Okay, so I'm going to stop at the end of my paragraph. I'm looking for the main idea. And as I'm reading along, it sounds more like an introduction. So it's almost an inverted triangle. I have Europeans hadn't been interested, maybe other European crusaders, and it's talking about some Italian trader. For the most part, they had neither entrance. But that changed in the 1400s. So this is my cue that the next part is what we're really getting at. So this sentence here, the desire to grow rich and to spread Christianity, that's going to be my main idea. Now, what I'd also like to add is a few comments in the margin. So I'm just going to do that in the form of a little text box. So Europeans had not been completely isolated from the rest of the world before the 1400s. So this is actually surprising to me. Because I had thought that Europeans were on their own. Okay, so let me just expand this out here. And then what I want to do is I want to go and underline the part that stuck out to me. So Europeans had not com been completely, I completely isolated. That's my comment there. Okay. Going along now, looking back, are there any words I didn't understand? Beginning around 1100, European crusader bothered Muslims for control of the Holy Lands in Southwest Asia. 1275, the Italian trader Marco Polo reached the court of Kublai Khan. Well, I'm actually going to underline Marto po Marco Polo because I didn't realize before that he was an Italian trader. I had always known him from... Oh, that's not what I meant. I had always known him to be from that, like, pool game that you have, Marco Polo. So I'm going to write that little comment in the margin. Okay, let me expand it here so you can see it. Okay, so there we have my other comment, my connection, if you will. For the most part, however, Europeans had neither the interest nor the ability to explore foreign lands. That changed by the early 1400s. So now I'm going to add in a question, because what I'm curious about is why did it change? So if I'm reading along for the first time, what was it about it that changed in the early 1400s? Why? And then reading my last sentence again, the desire to grow rich and to spread Christianity, coupled with advances in sailing technology, spread an age of European exploration. Aha, so this looks like it's my answer to my question here. So I'm just actually going to go ahead and answer it right here. Um, growing rich, religion, and new technology. So I'm sort of summarizing what the answer is to that question. That caused an age of European exploration. Okay, so let's check. So what have I got? I've got my main idea. I've got a question. I've got a comment. I've got a connection. There weren't any words I didn't understand except maybe Kublai Khan. I wonder if there's a way I can circle it on here. All right, well, that kind of messes up the formatting. Around. But Kublai Khan, you sort of see that um, I've, un I've circled it there. Maybe I would put a question mark by it. Not entirely sure what that means. I might have to look that up. So that's the first, first paragraph. That's what annotation looks like. Again, this is pretty similar to what I saw a lot of you guys doing. If there's any parts that you weren't doing at this point, definitely make sure that you're getting all those elements and really engaging with this text to go deeper in it than just what it says on the outside. So what I'd like you to do now is continue on with this reading for the next few sections, doing all those annotation techniques, looking for words you don't know, underlining, finding the main idea, questions, comments, connections. At the very end, there is a short summary. I actually got bumped onto two pages. So I just want you to summarize in broad the main idea of this article. So you're going to look for the main idea in each paragraph. And then remember, we're zooming out to find the main idea of the article. And then naming at least three important details. OK, and that should be it. So I will check this. Uh, please remind me to check this when you come back on Monday. I hope you had a great band trip. And if you have any questions, send me an email, mizordbailey at gmail.com.